just generally, I'm hoping most folks, if not all, have been a part of the previous dialogue session. So we started out with an introduction of the overall touchstones of hope. Um, and we did our first session, um, this was last year, actually November, we did our first session in January on non-discrimination. Um, and then we moved to the first part of self-determination, as we mentioned, was more of a legal analysis of the legislations that existed both in Canada and the US um, and what that might mean. Today, we're talking about more on the ground realities. Um, Maybe I'll just ask the organizer, since I have a whole bunch of uh, just names and, and <laughs> pictures in front of me, if you do see her come back online, can you just send me a message so that I know to reintroduce her? Otherwise, I'll continue on with um, the next uh, the next presentation. Awesome. Um, she just joined. Okay, perfect. Yes. Perfect. I'll that. just I'll just wrap up on the next uh, Touchstones of Hope and then uh, we'll get Julie back on. Great to have you back, Julie. Um, Sorry, I got lost. I'm, there's a button that came on and I clicked it and it took me off. Oh, so. no. Okay, oh. perfect. So, yeah, I just, just to wrap up, um, the next one that we have scheduled is the holistic approach, uh, which is happening uh, July 20th. Uh, check the NICWA website and then we have two more after that. Um, so, without further ado, Julie, um, welcome back and I'll hand thank it you. back over to you. Glad you're, glad you're back. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So again, I'm um, sorry about that, but this is, yeah, this is our kinship structure that we have that we um, identify the importance of our, this is a important structure of our work that we do with our policy and procedures and the generational impacts that we have with our, um, yeah, the, the structure, the kinship structures that we utilize within the work that we do. So the next one. Um, these are like the family logic models that we go through as well. You know, we look at the historical trauma, the issues that we have, the resources that we utilize, um, you know, with our different programs and we um, utilize the respect and honesty, you know, look at our water and land with the resources we have with our community members, you know, we um, provide our culture, education programs, recreational, vocational services, our culture and traditions. And we look at strategies, um, working with our youth programs, um, serving, you know, as our leaders as well. We have a youth development program, a youth leadership council, and we have our family preservation programming. Um, we have some outcomes that we have for our youth, increased number of youth attending, youth development activities. We decrease the number of youth participating in unhealthy or illegal activities. For um, resiliency and integrity, we have family strengths program outcomes, you know, increasing our participation in traditional ways and parenting through culture. Um, we look at community outcomes to increase our community unity, increase community-wide cultural events. Um, and then we look at our strengths with culture and traditions in our community and um, connections and our resiliency. So we try to use our um, family logic model as well. And um, when I was talking about policy and procedures in regards to like um, the jurisdictions, um, we have to also look at that in regards to um, our comprehensive plan. Um, what kind of helped us too within these family logic, logic models, you know, trying to make sure that we had connections and resources um, we do say, you know, we have the health programs and mental health programs and substance abuse and, you know, our juvenile justice is that we had to really collaborate with our um, tribal courts and um, help help with the knowledge of our judges and our judges are excellent judges um, that are able to assist with, you know, helping us through policies and procedures and um, along with um, the law enforcement. We had to do a lot of training with our law enforcement and working with us. And we provided um, collaboration and training um, with our law enforcement and um, really got them involved with um, child welfare. And so that helped out a lot with um, the trust building within the community um, for law enforcement and for the child welfare and our child protection systems. And regarding, um, we have a law and order committee as well that oversee and they help us, you know, um, with feedback and, and give us advice as far as like um, policies that we have to 
implement or that we need to be looking at um, along with our office of legal, um, our attorneys, you know, we have to have them assist us with a lot of the um, policies and procedures that we have to implement um, into our department. And we also have a um, quick, it's called our Community Wellness Improvement Collaboration Committee that you know, also works with all of these issues, resources, and strategies that we have to look when we're looking at a family logic model. So um, this committee is an improvement committee and they look at, they do a lot of strategies with prevention, um, like with our warming station, homelessness, and our transition housing for substance abuse. So, and then we also look at the funding streams that we have and how can we coordinate and collaborate to make sure that we're, um, you know, meeting the needs of the community and, and meeting those outcomes that we need to have um, for our families. And then you can go to the next slide. Um, again, the white bison, um, we utilize that within our Yellowhawk a and um, department and they, this is kind of um, not kind of blurry, but this is what we um, utilize within our communities, the Well Variety Movement. And we have some community members that are really taking a hold of the Well Variety Movement. And so they um, are really looking at the alcoholism, codependency, and the sometimes it addresses the violence. And so, um, you know, but it addresses the root of the, you know, the root of the causes that we have. We wanna get down to the root and try to make sure that we um, are healing. And so um, we, we, we help utilize this and we help support um, our clinic and our community members, you know, to um, move in that direction of well variety and healing. Because a lot of it is with grief and um, things that, you know, need to be um, addressed at the root. And if we don't get down to the root, um, it's, a little, it's a little harder to address the, you know, family issues. And then you can go ahead and go to the next. And this is just our, our tribal historical trauma genogram that we also utilize. And so um, um, we have that, we utilize the Gona, um, which is the gather, gathering of Native Americans, our family strengths, um, a differential response that we use, which is prevention, and then our family preservation. And then the next slide. So our family preservation, again, um, we utilize the wisdom warriors, our skill builders, our child care and coaching, motherhood is sacred, um, and fatherhood is sacred, and our well variety which is the daughters of tradition, sons of tradition, the families of tradition, then the wellness management skills, healthy relationships. Um, sometimes we call in Native Wellness Institute or positive in and parenting, you know, with NICWA, with National Indian Child Welfare Association and the cultural connections and our wisdom warriors. And the wisdom warriors is, um, helps with a lot of um, action plans. And so we have um, those that are trained in wisdom warriors and they, kind of set up with families and their, um, the parents in regards to um, what is your action plan. So we try to help set goals and to help them, you know, build skills, um, whether it be for employment or whether it be for, um, you know, core issues or things or their health, you know, they have diabetes or they have things that they need to work on that's keeping them from employment because some of that, that is ties into some of the issues they have in child welfare or child protection. And that's how we change, um, that's how we're changing our child welfare is we need to look at the, you know, what are some of the barriers that they have and working through the process with them and giving them guidance to have action plans and to meet goals and to have those outcomes. And then the next. So these are just some of the program tools, you know, the preservation approach um, and the ACE, you know, we're trying to implement the ACE to have that assessment um, um, that is, you know, with our um, children and I'm hoping Yellowhawk will help with this assessment and um, our cultural surveys and the individual um, mapping with the medicine will, the family assessments, our family preservation plans, our crisis prevention plans, and just to celebrate accomplishments um, is another, another um, 
tool that we use because we like to want to be able to celebrate, you know, when they when the families do have their accomplishments, because um, not always do we get to celebrate. So we we try to celebrate those that um, have made their, you know, um, families, you know, their whether it be the cultural celebrations we have, the, you know, because they do, we have, we still have um, those that, you know, are hunting or fishing that do have, you know, those, um, um, yeah, there are ceremonies that we have. So we, we try to celebrate those times as well. So the next one, these are the cultural connections as we were stating, um, as far as like the dancing, the drumming, basket weaving, you know, preserving our foods, the baby board making, um, ribbon shirt moccasins, self-care through art and our horses. And so these are some of the cultural connections and some of the, I know some of the funding streams don't always um, support some of these because they're tribal best practices, but they are our best practices. And so um, I know that we have to utilize a lot of evidence-based practices, but we try to um, utilize these cultural connections to help, you know, our um, travel, you know, child welfare programs. So this is what our families like to, um, you know, um, participate in. And so we try to make sure that this is available um, for our families. So those, I mean, those are our cultural connections. And I'm not sure how much time I have. Um, am I still have some time or am I good? Julie, you're, you're doing great. We've got um, uh, 30 minutes left of the, of the session and we just have a video and then some questions and answers. So if you wanted to go on for a few more minutes, okay. you're welcome to. Okay. So I have, um, um, I have one of my staff members here because I wanted to make sure that she had um, shared a little bit about our child welfare and how um, we are ever changing and evolving. <laughs> and I just want to share because it's not always about me as a director. I have a team and that's what makes the difference. Hello, my name is Dion Bronson. I'm a tribal member here of the Confederated Tribes Umatilla Indian Reservation. And most recently, I've in the last couple of years, I've got to be a part of the team at um, DCFS and in specifically, I'm the ICWA caseworker. Um, and it's just been a privilege to join um, this team as, the, as the work's been done in our community. And I'm not sure if Julie was, um, she's pretty humble, um, but she ensures that this department is connected to all the other departments and programs within our tribe and even externally um, in our local communities to one, ensure that we are up to date and know our community resources, but also to share the, the, the programs and supports that we can offer as, as a tribe and as a department. Um, and with that said, in working in the ICWA caseworker role, you can tell with Julie's, I guess, character and her leadership abilities and to create strong partnerships um, the State Department of Human Services, specifically the Tribal Affairs Unit and the nine tribes have come together to help be a part of that, that revisioning for our welfare systems and really recognizing the history from tribal perspective and acknowledging, you know, land bases and honoring those ancestors and those those native communities are indigenous communities that were living on those lands that now we're no longer a, get to be a, um, a part of because of, you know, the infiltration, the American Holocaust. And so to be able to recognize our past, move forward and heal together, um, I've got to see it on the, I guess I would say midstream of the river um, of, of moving forward. But with that, I, I think it's exciting because now funding streams, the First Families Act, the Family Preservation um, Programs will help 
be a part of that vision of transformation and really allowing tribes to be authentic and localized with including our, our lifestyle, our seasonal round, our hunting, our gathering, our arts, our storytelling, our prayers in that seasonal cycle of um, just be, being, getting to remember who we are and, and where we've got to go and planning for that seven generations ahead. What is it going to look like? Not just now, but what is it going to look like seven generations ahead? And, and talking about um, the grief, the loss, the isolation, and, and the epidemics that we're facing of overweight and obesity, diabetes, because we've been removed from those lands, because we've been isolated from our culture. It was against the law to practice our spirituality and, and you know, our languages were forced. So being able, being recognized um, and acknowledged that those ways, our ways be validated is I guess exciting and brings hope to our tribe. And then being able to get to share that with our families that are working in the system gives them hope and lets them know that maybe it was their ancestors' voice or their parents' voice that were heard that we need this. We need our, our authentic selves. We need our language. We need our songs. We need, you know, to be able to pray in the way that we, we need to. And our mental health plan not may not include going to mental health counseling. It may be going to sweat. It may be going to those AA meetings. It may be going on a horse ride with the auntie or uncle, but being able to take pride in that and know that that works. And now knowing that funding is going to be supporting that, I guess, is, is where I find hope and I find, I guess, passion to keep serving and being a part of that vision and change and being part of the team and the village that helps our, our children, our families and our community. So I guess that's really all I have to say as a staff, but I just am really, I really appreciate all the work that's being done on behalf of our children and families all over the United States and not just in the United States, but to the North of us and to the South of us um, and in those indigenous communities. And I think it's time that we honor our uniqueness and move forward as human beings. That's all. Thank you, Dion. So um, yeah, um, like I said, she has come in with a lot of passion and that's what we need for our tribal staff, you know, is to have the passion and have, you know, there is hope, we have it and we can do it together. So I'm thankful for all the other tribes joining and all the other, you know, programs and, you know, whether it be federal, state, or, you know, just the community. So um, we appreciate it. And that's all we have today as well. And thank you for be, letting us be a part of this. Thank you so much, Julie. I uh, really appreciate your whole presentation and also getting the, uh, the feedback um, directly from one of your, uh, one of your staff. Um, it's just like, this is the work, right? Like it's, it happens on the ground and um, it looks a lot different um, depending upon where you are, but there's so many uh, components that I think really resonate across, across the board. Uh, so thank you so much for sharing that. Um, so I, unfortunately, in the day, in the, the days and months of COVID, um, we often get double and triple booked <laughs> sometimes. So um, I'm so happy to introduce the next video. And Terry Cross has so graciously agreed to help support the Q&A portion of the, um, of this session, um, so that I can join another meeting um, on, on, uh, another important matter. Uh, so uh, I'm going to hand it off to Terry Cross. Unfortunately, the elder that we had um, joining us for today was unable to come due to internet issues um, where he's located, but we do have a, um, a video um, that Terry is going to introduce. And I would encourage everybody to ask your questions in the chat box for any of the presenters, Julie or Jeffrey, um, and that uh, Terry will also help to, to moderate and, and ask some of those questions. So thank you so much for having me. And uh, Terry, please uh, 
take it away. Thank you. Um, and sorry, you have to leave us, Jocelyn. So I, I, I want to introduce Andrew Beaver. Uh, Andrew could not be with us because um, their internet is down in his community, which is not unusual. Um, and I had a conversation with, uh, with Andrew on Friday. Uh, back uh, about uh, five, six years ago, Andrew did a presentation at a leadership academy in, in Bethel, Alaska, and I had the opportunity to record that. So I'm going, we're going to share that. And that's exactly what we wanted him to share today. Um, uh, Andrew is from the village of Quigilinuk. And I apologize to them for not saying it probably as well as it should be said. Um, it's commonly referred to in Alaska as the village of Quig. Uh, and um, Andrew um, is the uh, village uh, child welfare worker. Um, his position is a, uh, funded by the Indian Child Welfare Act, and it's a half-time position. Uh, it's a village of 400 people. And it's right on the Bering Sea. Um, as a matter of fact, when I talked to Andrew on Friday, he had just come back from walrus hunting. And, um, and so uh, it's a village that lives a pretty much a subsistence lifestyle, very, um, very traditional. Uh, uh, and 99% uh, of the population of their village is, is Yupik. Um, so, uh, I want to share this. Now, a little bit of, of Andrew's history. Andrew um, did, did not have a formal education, but got hired um, by the state as a village, uh, what was called a behavioral health worker um, in uh, the 90s and uh, in the early 2000s. In uh, about 2008, um, Andrew uh, was offered an early retirement when the state was in some financial difficulty. And um, he took it and um, within days became the, the uh, child welfare worker for the village. Um, and the re one of the reasons he did that, he had seen so much damage being done to his village by uh, workers flying in to their village uh, from Anchorage or from Bethel, uh, loading kids onto airplanes to be taken to be placed in foster care in Anchorage and other locations and then never return. And so Andrew made the decision along with his tribal council uh, to form a, what they recalled a child protection team um, and uh, to end the practice of children being removed from um, their village. Um, and you're going to hear the story of how they made that decision. Andrew told me Friday um, that because of their work, they haven't had a child placed outside of their village in the last 10 years. And in the last uh, year plus, they have not had one case of child abuse or neglect in their village. Uh, that they've made such tremendous changes because of the way they're practicing. Um, their, um, their practice is uh, to intervene early and to offer help, but to set high standards. So um, Amory's uh, gonna go ahead and play the video and then we'll have the question and answer. Let me just make sure I have my sound going. So please let me know if you don't hear it. I'll go ahead and start. And I think you can, yeah, make. I'll read it there. In the beginning, we tried to look for outside technical resources. Seems like there's none of them when they come to us and speak to us. It's an uh, outside uh, perspective. But we, after we have many workshops, we decided we need to build it from where we are. We can start from the bottom, where we are. Start, start from the scratch and build it from there. And uh, but, uh, 
how we started is like uh, we used our tribal authority and used that official authority to establish that child protection. Looks like we're having trouble with it loading. Yeah, sorry about that. I have it on um, through Vimeo, so it's online. So it might be my Wi-Fi. Um, you want me to try to play it through? Um, I have it loaded on my computer, and I could play it. I think if somebody right. makes me a co-host. Yes, you should be a co-host. Let me just double check. You're a co-host. Okay. Um, I'm sorry about that. I can try to push play one more time, but it might do it again. Yeah, let me let me show it out. I got it. I'm sorry, everybody, but thank you for your patience. <laughs> and we, I may have to adjust my sh sound. I can see your screen. Can you hear it? Yes. as a leader in the community, but 
Lord, to be a servant of helping my community to, to protect their children. And uh, whenever I have a child protection team meeting, it's amazing how each team member can uh, put in ideas to me as the next worker, because I work one to one with uh, clients, especially parents, to protect their children. And in the past, before we have developed our child protection team, it was hard. I have, didn't have no place to go to. Even I go to council, they don't know what this uh, child protection service system is all about. The team is the res my resource, number one resource. And they're, they, have, they bring in culture, uh, knowledge. Some of them come from school, as a school, school worker, from, also from the experience of being healthy. And uh, the resources are already there in your community, so make use of them. I encourage you, you could do it. But one thing we couldn't do is we couldn't go to your community and tell you this is how you should do it. Each community is different. They can develop their own system. And it's amazing uh, when you attend trainings without knowing uh, that the diagrams, it's already there. If you use the culture system practices, it's going to work. I think we need to cut off our dependency to federal or state doing services for us in our community. We need to start uh, empowering our governing body and take the responsibility and er er ownership. I think our early intervention services help us to this day. We never have a single uh, kid suicide or any suicide. But it hurts us when our neighbors, our, our tribal communities have incidents. It affects us. But uh, I think the community needs to deal with these issues internally from the heart of the community. That's the only way we can uh, cut down the state case loop and help uh, with the uh, but, but their high rate of uh, suicide or take children take out of both. So thank you for the time. Well, um, this is, a, I think, an example of self-determination at its, uh, at its very heart um, in a village of 400 people decides um, that they're not going to have any more uh, removals and they're going to end child abuse in their community. Uh, one of the things that um, I, Andrew has shared and, and would have shared today if he could have been here is that the way his child protection team works is that when they hear of, a, of trouble in their community, if there's been a domestic argument or if there's been a party, um, three members of the team go and knock on the family's door. Um, and their first question is, is everybody all right? We heard there was difficulty and we want to make sure everybody's safe and all right. Can we come in and talk with you? Uh, and their message is, um, everybody in our village is, is too important for us to not look the other way, you know, for us to look the other way. And we want you to know we love you and we want you to know that we're watching and that we have standards for how our children are treated. Um, and he just told me on Friday that um, one of their major interventions is that people who are um, not meeting the standard of how children should be treated in their community have to spend time in the sweat house with the elders. And sometimes at six or seven or eight hours of sitting in the sweat house, learning about their traditions and learning about their 
uh, the uh, practices for how children should be treated and how what it means to be a good human being. He said the and um, and Andrew is seventy years old, but he talks about um, having the elders talk to people. So um, he's um, he still considers himself in that middle generation, not as one of the elders yet. So uh, just wanted to share that. Thank you. So let's uh, let's jump in there with questions and. Um, Jennifer, and can you help me with the fielding of the questions in the question box? And so jump right in there. Yes, absolutely. Um, we've had one question from Patricia, and I think this could be put to both Julie uh, and Jeff. Um, I'll, I'll just say quick, for those of you who didn't meet me in the chat, my name is Jennifer King. I'm uh, coming to you from Canada. I'm with the First Nations Child and Family Caring Society. Um, I'm Anishinaabe. My family comes from the Wisoxing First Nation. Oh, sorry, my daughter just popped her head in. Uh, so our question from uh, Julie, she's wondering about the role that advocacy could play in supporting families uh, in her community, they still see a lot of colonial practices and children and families being harmed through that. And how um, could an advocate support the rights of families and help to educate social workers? So um, from reading that question, it sounds to me like um, social workers are still kind of in the position of the adversary and, and not a support to families. So I'm wondering if Julie and Jeff have any thoughts on that. Would you like to go first, Julie, or? Oh, you can, Jeff. That's fine. Okay, sure. Um, well, I mean, I would just say that I think, you know, a big part of self-determination for urban agencies is advocacy. And we certainly see ourselves at Native Child as doing advocacy for community. Um, you know, all of our, as I said earlier in my presentation, when we're developing programs and services, we're co-developing them with community. Community will tell us what they're after. And then often when we go to try to enact that, there's barriers, right? And we need to advocate um, to change those things. Uh, I think that, um, you know, we still find as an Indigenous age, I mean, this is exactly why we need Indigenous agencies. Like up until, you know, before 2004, all the Indigenous folk in the city of Toronto were being seen by mainstream agencies that did social work very, very differently. Um, the majority of our staffing base is Indigenous, but we still have allies that are helping us do the work. But we find that uh, even when we're hiring uh, Indigenous social workers, they're still coming out of university with a very colonial idea about what social work is because the curriculum really hasn't changed as much as it needs to in terms of universities. So, I mean, there's a lot to unpack in your question. I think uh, for us, our advocacy is directed by community through conversations around what is needed um, at an individual family and, you know, broader community consultation level. Uh, I think that advocacy takes a, a, a variety of different forms, pushing for policy change or the removal of barriers, uh, pushing for changes in curriculum, uh, and then also doing a lot of work internally to ensure that our staff are practicing in a way that's congruent with our vision and service model. So I hope that's a, I hope that answers at least part of your question. Thank you. Um, this is Julie. Are you going to say something, Terry? No, go ahead, Julie. Okay. Oh, okay. So, I mean, for us, as far as advocacy, I know that, like I said, with our, we really communicate and try to work with our local um, DHS and our CPS and all of our, you know, staffs that work within the child welfare and our child protection services. And so um, they have really, I think they're really listening and then they're trying their best, you know, as far as like advocating for families and how we, um, you know, work with our CPS departments um, and do the cross reports and the jurisdiction, you know, the issues that we have with jurisdiction um, and making sure our staff know, you know, as far as what is the jurisdiction. And, um, and we also have tribal state agreements that we um, also review with um, both DHS and with the tribe. And then um, as far as like, they even are going, they did have a transformation plan. And so instead of using child care or child welfare caseworkers, they've changed to family resource 
you know, family resource um, specialist or something more than, you know, because people don't like to say, oh, I'm going to go see my caseworker, you know, um, so they kind of are moving away from that, which is, you know, been very helpful for some of the families. So they are um, looking at tran transformations of their programs at DHS and how they're um, working towards um, our families. So um, we've been collaborating with them on training um, and train, you know, working with each other to train staff. So that's been very helpful. And, and for the advocacy of our families, um, I think it's been working really well so far. Julie, I have a question and I know a little bit about your program. Can you say a little bit about the changes that have occurred like in your caseload uh, since you began the type of work that you're doing now? Um, and I, you're, I think your reduction in foster care has been pretty dramatic, has it not? Yeah, when we first um, started, um, I just started back in 2011. And I'm not going to go back clear that far and tell you the whole story, <laughs> but 2011 um, started. And like I said, um, it was the policy procedures that we needed to try to work on. And like you said, the family preservation and the culture and, and the staffing that we needed to train and the communication and collaboration was the most important part of it is like, like um, Dion was stating, we need to work with other programs and resources to provide for the families that they were having barriers and so we did work with our child protection team and our law enforcement and our legal office to make sure that we had policies, you know, that were family preservation policies. And so, um, and made sure that our CPS was, you know, preserving the families and doing family stability plans, you know, because a lot of time it is the families that are struggling with barriers, whether it be their housing, their employment, their transportation, um, you know, as far as like um, childcare, you know, they can't get to work if they don't have childcare. So trying to have, and their education, trying to have all this, you know, to be able to address their um, needs that they have and trying to have staff and department programs to help with these. Um, we went from probably, probably like, I think I started, but there's about 75 or more in care. Um, once we got um, things moving and um, did our policy and procedures and made sure our staffing was there. Now we only have, for the past four years that I've been here, maybe even five, we only have about 20 that are in care. So we did reduce, um, you know, significantly as far as um, our children in care. Um, we have about maybe 10 that are in family stability plans that we're working with to make sure that they stabilize and that we provide them the services that they need um, like I said, with the employment, you know, training that they need and being able to, you know, work with them with their housing needs as well. Because that's always the issue is, you know, that they have is they just need that little help. And um, we have the resources of the tribe, we just need to be able to access. And if it's not with the tribe, it's with the state. And if it's not with the state, it's the, you know, federal. But most of the time we can find resources. And I really try to work with our um, staff to make sure that they have knowledge of resources. Thank you, Julie. Another dramatic example of how important self-determination is. Um, and, and you know, your, your program is really applying these principles of the touchstones in a, in a really good way. Um, Amory, uh, Sarah, do you have information about our next uh, session? I'm sure that I see that we're just about out of time. Yes, we will put that in the chat. Our next session is right now tentatively scheduled for Tuesday, July 20th um, at um, 10 a.m. Pacific time, 1 p.m. Eastern time. And we can go ahead and put a link in the chat as well. Um, and I can put in that information here. Oh, thank you so much, Jennifer. Um, and um, yes, we also have some uh, links that we can put in as well. We have all of our previous recordings available on NICWA's YouTube channel. And we also have um, a website on both the Caring Society and NICWA's um, website so you can um, learn more about the series and this partnership that we have ongoing to share this. Um, as you can see on the screen, these are ways to connect with both um, um, the Caring Society and NICWA. 
Um, so I think that covers everything. Uh, thank you to both uh, Jeffrey and Julie for sharing your knowledge with us today and being present and taking the time. And thank you everyone for joining us and your patience as we had some technical difficulties, but we made it happen and it was collaborative. So that's the huge plus. Yes, um, and and um, Terry, did you want to say anything else in closing? I think that's all I wanted to share. Oh, I just want to thank uh, all of our presenters. This has been a terrific, um, I really like the, uh, all the way from the urban response and the big city of Toronto, all the way out to uh, the Umatilla Reservation and on up into Quigilinook. It's uh, pretty amazing what's happening across uh, Turtle Island in um, implementing these touchstones. So thank you. All right, have a great day, everyone. Thank you so much. Take care, everyone. Goodbye. Bye.